This analysis will differ slightly from my other more science-based analyses. It will include an element of morality as well. K.H. mentions suffering. Hamza and Abbas provide some scriptural justification for suffering before moving back to the discussion. So I'll give you an yeah. example. If you take a country like Somalia and you see the, 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 you know, the civil war and the troubles and the famines and all of these things, what's the suicide rate there? Hamza is implying that people in Somalia accept their hardship as a test of their faith and that there would be a low suicide rate. Here is a list of countries ranked per suicide rate adjusted per population compiled by the World Health Organization. You will see Somalia is 29th on the list. This is out of 183 countries. This article, which I will link in the description, shows the widespread prevalence of mental disorders, substance abuse disorders, sexual violence against women and poor quality of life in the Somali population. This is demonstrated in the rising suicide rates, so clearly they are not gladly seeing their hardships as a test. So we just happen to be something that had arisen out of the mechanics of the way the universe works, and we happen to be these conscious beings, yeah? Mm -hmm. So it's essentially sort of a, a really amazing accident, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. So in your conception of the world, it, how do you believe that there is no purpose, no intention? We're just random accidents. We're here for a short time and then we're going to you know, go, go into nothing. It doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. Is there any good or evil or suffering or non-suffering? There is no external purpose or intention attributed to our lives. There is purpose and intention which we can generate for ourselves giving meaning. Good and evil exist within our reality when we judge the outcomes of actions as good or bad for our well-being or suffering. Because, I, because now I'm a product of my, of my evolution and I'm a product of all of these things that have happened, I'm a random yeah. uh, a, a, a process where I've become a, an individual is a random process. Everything mm. that I do is dictated by whatever I've learned, experienced or whatever. And I go on, on to do something horrible like killing somebody. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. Because that's the nature that I've now acquired because of my evolutionary and experiential pathways. Am mm. I doing something good or am I doing something bad when I do that? We can judge if something is good or bad by the intention and the outcome and the cognitive ability of the individual. So a distinction could be made between a murder or euthanasia. Other factors to take into account are the state of mind of the person at the time. So a child or mentally impaired person committing the act would not be as immoral as a fully mentally capable person would be. My, the thoughts that are going through my mind are simply the chemical reactions that are caused by the chemical reactions from the previous point and, and so on and so on. Yeah. And I am just really a mechanism that has the illusion of free will that does things. Mm -hmm. So if I stick a knife in a child, that has no moral quality to it. It's just an action. How would you feel if it was your child? Would that upset you? We have the capacity for empathy. We can see how our actions impact on others and derive moral judgments from analysing the outcomes of these actions. You seem to imply that if we do not believe in a soul, then we think we are just atoms interacting. This is not the case, as we can act as moral agents. There is a degree of choice in this matter. Like the lion eating the baby, and me eating the baby, what would the difference be? Why is it when it comes to me yeah. that you're saying... This is bad, but when it comes to the lion, you're saying this is okay. Was the lion fully capable of analysing its actions and the outcomes? Did it kill for survival? Did it have alternatives? These are considerations that humans can make, but lions can't. A male lion, when it takes over another pride, it yeah. will kill all the infant lions that are there so that it can mate with the, they will, the females will come into heat. It will mate with yeah. them so it can pass on its own genes. Is that lion killing the infant lions, the cubs, mm -hmm. is that a good thing or a bad thing? When looked at through our perspective, it appears a bad thing. The lion, however, doesn't have this ability to view actions in this way and act as a moral agent. It follows instinct that's been passed down through generations. 
When new males take over a pride of lions, they almost always kill the present cubs. This stops the females from nursing these cubs and so makes them receptive to mating. Lionesses give birth once every two years and males only have a two-year window in which to pass on their genes. This behaviour is therefore highly selected for survival of their genes. Any male that did not demonstrate this behaviour would find it much harder to pass on his genes. You see, our morality today is a product of social consensus. And that social consensus primarily has come from religious roots. No, humans cooperated into groups, then became civilizations. Rules that helped humans flourish in civilizations were later adapted by religion. We're told that Allah has given us all a fitra, a, a, a predisposition, a, a foundation within ourselves that recognizes the good from the bad. We have evolved morality through learning how to cooperate, which helps survival. This is seen in all societies, and a society that does not have cooperation will likely die out. This has nothing to do with religion. And so you've recognized that certain things are bad. For example, uh, a man killing another man or a man killing a child, you see. <clears throat> Now, where yeah. your your worldview gets into a, a very big problem is if I said to you, for example, you drug a lady so she's completely unconscious, and then astaghfirullah, and then ten men decide to rape her, mm -hmm. and she will have no memory and no <laughs> physical adverse effects as a consequence. Is that mm -hmm. good or bad in your worldview? Would anybody like to live in a society that allows that? That is one question. And then there is the right to bodily autonomy. In my worldview? Yes. In the moment, is she conscious? Well, I guess that doesn't matter. It is bad by any oh. standard of measurement. So there's no harm standard. as far as the woman is concerned because she's never yeah, going to remember I, I understand anything. I... Even if she never remembers, there is an invasion of her human rights. Looking at it on a societal level, nobody would agree to any procedure where there is a risk that this could happen to them or their loved ones. This is not outweighed by how many people would derive enjoyment from this act. Right. We're asking you to be consistent, basically. What we're saying is that if you are consistent, you would have to accept, as vulgar as it is, as sickening as it is, you would have to agree, if you were consistent, that you can't say it's a bad thing. You can say it's a bad thing if you look at it through the human rights principle and through the consequentialist approach, as described earlier. The problem is, mm -hmm. though, by saying that, there is something intrinsic within not only your heart, but the hearts of all people, whether they're atheists, whether they're religious, whether they're not religious, that this is an evil act. And I'm arguing that the only explanation that you can have for that is that that moral code has been given to you in your fitra. I agree we have an inherent moral code, but you have not provided any evidence of it being implanted by a divine being. So you're, you come from a perspective that there, there is nothing immaterial there's nothing immaterial. So everything is energy and matter. And there are mechanisms that happen within this. And those mechanisms have led to our bodies, our minds, our brains, our experiences, our very thoughts forming. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah? Mm -hmm. so our yeah. very thoughts are the process of chemical reactions that are them of themselves have no option but to interact the way they do. Then our thoughts are automatically the consequence of those things. So our thoughts themselves are not something that we can have any idea of control so this idea of even free will or free thinking is an illusion that you have about yourself because your thoughts are mm -hmm. the pro uh, are the results of chemical processes or physical processes that are happening within your brain that are just uh, standard reactions dr imran here is committing first of all the fallacy of composition this is an informal fallacy that arises when one infers that something is true of the whole from the fact that it's true of some part of a whole. 
In reality, emergent properties arise from the sum of properties and functions of its parts. We are all made of atoms, but we do not behave like atoms. We have emergent properties. The next implication is that if you do not believe in a soul, then you cannot believe in free will, as atoms are unable to make choices. It's clear we do not have libertarian free will, which is the view that people's choices are free from prior causes. In this view, how could you explain people's behaviours due to mental illness such as schizophrenia? Or this man who developed abnormal sexual tendencies after a brain tumour grew in the orbitofrontal cortex of his brain. These tendencies stopped after he had the tumour removed and then returned when the tumour grew back. We clearly have some free will. Look at the way a tax on plastic bags led to a massive drop in the use of disposable plastic bags. The reality is some form of compatibilism. We have limited free will to make choices, but have to manage desires of which we can't control. Imagine resisting a chocolate cake when trying to lose weight. So, for example, I want a mobile mm. phone. I see a 10-year-old carrying a nice iPhone. I take that iPhone. That's the path of least suffering, isn't it? If you have the capacity to contemplate the consequences of your actions, then you would realise that such an action could lead you being punished by the law. You may then realise that it's much easier not to steal and to instead earn the money to buy what you desire. This is what separates us from other animals, the ability to rationalise our behaviour and consider the consequences of our actions. If you're going to apply the same standard to the human being, you need to apply the same standard to the lion. No, for reasons which I hope is now clear to anybody watching this analysis.